Empire War Expanded has involved making tons of new mechanics for the game over the years, and it's always a very involved process. We're going to be going through that process today. First, you need to know what you're doing before you can do it. So step one is to make a rough outline of the overall core functions you need to have working. When talking about implementation, you only really want to worry about broad principles rather than getting too bogged down in specifics. Today we'll be working on a tactical faction mechanic for the Mandalorians in Revan's Revenge called Bloodlust, one which will also be used by the Avethans in Thrawn's Revenge, where an enemy ship will be targeted. If that vessel is taken down, the faction gets a temporary buff, and if they fail, they get a debuff. So those are the three things we really need to worry about. Targeting a ship, spawning a buff, and making sure it's all applying for the right factions. Once the mechanic has an overall plan, with Empire War Expanded being a team project, it is important to make sure everyone's on board. So I headed to Discord and asked for feedback. Since everyone seemed really enthusiastic about it, I headed back to our to-do list and got started. We already broke everything into fairly manageable chunks, because you never want to do everything at once or else you're going to introduce problems and have no idea where they are. So we're starting by setting up the new plugin file, where we'll be doing most of our coding, and then we'll set the reward buff to spawn and delete 30 seconds later. Most of the actual values will be changeable later, it'll be easy to go into the code to do that, so all we need to do is make sure the functions work. Plugins in Empire War Expanded are a core part of our coding framework designed by Pox, which allow us to piggyback easily on certain core game functions and tie different mechanics together. The easiest way to start is by copying an existing plugin, in this case Butana Hutta is what I'm starting with, and then modify it to be basically empty except for the three main functions we'll need from it. Copy pasting is a crucial skill to learn when programming, because why do a bunch of work you've already done elsewhere? Just make sure you're never copy pasting stuff you don't have permission to use. I already asked myself if I could use my old code, and I said it was okay, so we're all good here. Now we have a blank slate involving the new function up top, which basically creates the overall plugin and is home to variables we're able to use between all functions, indicated by them having self before the variable name. Right now this is mostly just the two faction variables, which we'll use to make sure the Mandalorians, who use the underboard player slot in Revenge Revenge, are the ones benefiting. Then there's the update function, which is in this plugin processed every frame, and that's where we're mostly going to be checking timers and telling everything else what to do. Finally, we have the game mode changed function, which checks if you've entered a new tactical battle and resets variables to the appropriate values for a new battle. The game knows to enter this function thanks to the crossplot subscribe you can see in the new function at the top. This gets a notification from a core Empire at War script called game scoring when that mode changes, which tells our new script that it needs to go and run through that game mode changed function. Now we can really get working. First, we need to have the game mode changed function set a variable indicating that it is in a tactical battle to true when the space battle starts, or to false when you're entering galactic, which I later learned isn't working properly, and I've also forgotten to leave the original version of this in the main function, so there's two mistakes already. But more importantly, we're adding in a position variable. This is just where we're going to spawn our buff, since any game object needs a location to spawn at, even if it's not truly an interactable object. We're just going to grab the location of the attacker entry position marker, which is a marker on every single space map where the attacker's first ship appears. We always want to get this position just once per battle, so we're setting this code to execute only if the position variable is set to nil, which basically means it has no value. Now we want to set up the core functions for having the buff spawn, which has a pretty simple logic right now. If the position variable is valid, and the spawn buff variable is set to true, then spawn the buff at a given position for the player we want to have it. Easy stuff. When we spawn that buff object, we do want to make sure we're setting it as a variable so that we can take other operations on it, like removing it when necessary, or even just the ability to check to see if it's there. We also want to set the position to nil before each battle, so it doesn't try to use the old position in a new battle. I then put two checks for the active buff. One makes sure you're checking for a prior buff before spawning a new one, so we don't duplicate them, and another checks to make sure the variable is reset if the buff doesn't exist for some reason. Since trying to act on an object which doesn't exist will crash not just this script, but every script tied to game scoring, and that would be bad. Much like not leaving a like or subscribing for more would be. But since these are going to be timed buffs, we need to have some variables set to track time-related information, so we know when the buffs were last spawned, how long they've been active, and when they last ended. This getCurrentTime function, which I had to check elsewhere to remember whether it has underscores or not, will return the time in-game. 
A cooldown period variable gives us the number we're comparing against when seeing if it's been long enough to choose a new target after a buff ends. To get the total time a buff was active, we want to know the current time, minus the time it started at, and then we have a number we can compare against the duration we want it to last for. If it's been around for too long, we can just despawn it. We also record the time the buff ended at, which we can now compare against our cooldown in the function which spawns the buff, by seeing if the end number plus the cooldown matches the current time. All of these checks go in the update function because that is the one that runs on every frame, and we always want to check the time against these factors. You'll notice a few times I do move code around because we want to make sure everything's happening the most sensible and easy to read order. In this example, I'm moving the check for the buff above the functions where we're doing stuff to the buff because if the buff isn't there, we don't need to do those things. So now what exactly do we have in this update function? First, it checks whether a spawn position is recorded. Then it checks if there's a buff which already exists, though really this isn't necessary in the current code because the other checks after it do that well enough. Then if there's no buff and the cooldown time has been exceeded, which originally counts from battle start, a buff will spawn. If the buff exists and it's been around for too long, the buff deletes and records the time. Pretty simple so far, so now we need to do the actual buff that it's going to spawn. To start with, I'm just going to copy a hero and use that. The more obvious something is or isn't working right now, the better. So we don't want the object hiding on us and a hero will show up on the map and in the top right corner. We can change the buff object later without needing to edit our main script at all. So with that simple object created, it's time to add in some screen text so the game will tell us where in the code it is at all times. Then we can go and game for the first test. We can see the messages saying the plugin is running on Galactic without doing any of the tactical function, which is exactly what we want. But once we're in a battle, everything is gone because the script has crashed. I'm running this in a debug build of the game that the devs have provided to modders, which gives additional error reporting, which is great, though it's way laggier and takes forever to launch, so this isn't what you'd normally be playing in. The log it produces does tell me the issue is our ending time variable, which starts as a nil value, and then we're comparing that against a number, which Lua can't do. So to fix that, we just have to make the default value zero instead of nil. I also fixed what I said earlier about deleting the variable saying whether it was a tactical battle in the new function. Also, the transition to galactic doesn't seem to trigger the mode starting function, so we need to add in a mode ending function which does trigger on leaving tactical battles accomplishing a fairly similar thing. This will mostly just exist to tell the game that we're leaving the tactical battle, that's all that function is really going to do. With that in place, we head in game once again and everything seems to work now. The text shows up and then so does the buff in the form of a massive shrimp. Hooray! So we can head to the git issue, change that into a checkbox so I can get the serotonin hit of checking it off, and we can move on to the next step making the buff apply only when a target is killed. Eventually this will mean a specific targeted ship, but first we'll spawn it on any enemy ship dying. I start by getting a variable which will record whether the faction we want to get this mechanic is there, since we do only want this code to run with certain factions present. Though for now this is automatically going to set to true, because I'm only going to be testing as the Mandalorians. Next we need the object destroyed notification from game scoring and the list of things we're listening for at the top of our script. Which, like the game mode starting and ending functions we already have, has its own connected function. As it is though, the game scoring event we're listening for doesn't tell listening scripts which specific object was destroyed, just the type. But we need to know the exact object, so we need to make a change to the original function which sends us this information adding in the object itself to the list of information called arguments that the function is passing. We need to add this on both the sending end in game scoring and the receiving end in our bloodlust script. This will be our new trigger for spawning the buff, so we can move the functions that handle that spawning into this code. And I get rid of the failsafe check for the buff, since it wasn't really doing anything up there. The check on the cooldown and active buff can stay in the update function, since that's going to be how we know when to pick a new target while the rest of this information we're moving is only relevant when a possible target actually dies. For now, again, target means any possible ship, so we don't need to be more specific in here just yet, aside from making sure there's not already an existing buff object before we spawn a new one. Then with some new debug text in place, we can head in game to try everything out. You luckily get to skip the loading screens and get straight to this stalwart dying, after which a nice buff spawns so once again everything is on the right track. Since deaths are working, we'll get to the faction checking. We need to actually know which factions are in the battle so we can know if a plugin should run and know who to pick a target from. And we need that information on battle starting, so we're in the mode start function. Luckily, the attacker entry flag we already used and the defending forces marker should give us the information we want. 
and I confirmed that with a quick message displaying the owners of those two objects, and a quick jump in game to test. If this hadn't worked, this would have needed some more annoying code, so this made me pretty happy. You'll notice these variables are called local, though, instead of using the self tag we've used basically everywhere else. This means these variables only exist in this one function, which is called their scope, compared to the scope of the other variables being able to be used everywhere in the script. Now we can just make those new local variables compared to the intended faction in our player variable, and if one of them matches, the rest of the plugin can be set to do what it's supposed to do. We're only worrying about the Mandalorians right now, I'll be working on the Vethans later, so we can check that off on our to-do list and move on to the next major step, choosing a specific target. But just as importantly, we need to mark those targets to make sure that the player knows what's going on. First, we'll set up a new particle object for this, just copying the boarding indicator for now, and we can make a new dedicated visual for it later. This needs to have a longer lifetime, which is the length of time it displays, since that should last however long we want the ship to be targetable. Then we need a new target variable, which will be set to the target ship object and then we need to add a check for whether that exists already to our function which decides if a target should be picked. Otherwise, it would just keep changing to a new target every frame, even if one was already active. Rather than continuing to pile more code in here, we'll make a new function for target selection. We'll use a lot of local variables here, since this information is all only relevant to this one function. The rest of the script only cares about the target it decides on, not how it gets there. We do need to know who the primary enemy is to pull a target from them, but that can be done using some of the faction checks we did on the attacker entry and defending forces position markers. To start us off on picking a target, we're going to get every single object belonging to the enemy of the capital, corvette, or frigate category, and we'll make a list out of those. That's what the find all objects of type function does. Then I'm going to make a for loop which goes through that entire list and adds a particle to it to make sure we're getting everything picked up correctly before we do the work to narrow that down to one ship. Otherwise, we'd only learn that something is being included which we don't want or excluded that we do want from a random bug report years down the line. As usual, this goes along with adding some extra debugging display information and a check to make sure that there's actually an enemy faction selected before you try to get all of their stuff. Then it's time for a quick test once again. Everything seems to be working, but you'll notice it's picking up the stations, which we don't want. The station also has those categories we're looking for, so we'll need to filter that out. My Canadian keyboard had some problems with this, but eventually I was able to manage getting in the property check for is Starbase, something that all Starbases have in common, and we can safely use to exclude them from this list. We still want to have our for loop that we used to use to apply the particles in order to check everything on the list for that property, but we don't need to have the line which attaches the particle in here anymore. In the future, if we had other things we wanted to check these objects for, it could go in this for loop as well though. Now we need to get one random ship off of that list of valid targets. So we need to generate a random number between one and the total number of objects on the list of enemy ships. This is what table.getN does. A table is a list, and getN gets the number of objects on that list. To be safe, I also added a check to make sure the table is bigger than zero, Otherwise, if there are no valid targets, it would still try to pick a target and the script would crash. Since this list contains all of the actual game objects, we can get our target object directly by assigning the target variable to whichever object is at that index, index meaning its location, on the list. And then we can just attach our particle to that as well. So if there's 20 enemy ships, the game will get a random number between 1 and 20, and then if it rolls, let's say, 13, it picks the 13th unit on that list, and that becomes our target. Once we're in game to test that, it picks only one target, which is again good news, and then after some typical Mandalorian overreach, we kill it and a buff spawns. So we basically got all the core functions done. I did a bit of extra testing to make sure all the timers work as well, and everything seems to work as intended. We do still need a few extra timers for this, since we need to know how long the player has to kill the unit for the last bit of the script, which is spawning a debuff if you fail to get it in a reasonable time. I bounced this between 30 and 60 seconds while testing, but the final numbers aren't super relevant for coding the basic setup that we're doing here. That's all going to change as things get playtested anyways. To handle the debuff, we need a new function in the main area which will be checked every update to make sure the target hasn't been around for longer than this new limit. If the target has been chosen for that long, we should spawn the debuff. We're also doing similar things in a few places related to spawning these buffs, and resetting timers repeatedly, so it makes sense to have a reset function which can be called to handle all of those timers being set, and removing the active buff rather than repeating code elsewhere. 
There's some other duplicate code in here that I fix up later, but I also make a dedicated function for spawning a buff for the same reason. There's no point having the same code everywhere. We just need to have one function handling spawning, and all it has to know is whether we want the success or failure buff, which is going to be indicated by the one argument it's passed, called success, being true for a success or false for a failure. Then the call for this function can be placed anywhere we want this to happen. Then to help with visibility for players, I added in some extra text at the top left of the screen the same way that we'd been doing the debug messages earlier. Most of those messages have been removed by this point because I've already tested all of the functions they're tied to, and everything seemed to be working. We still need to set up the failure buff itself, but first we need to figure out exactly what kind of object the buffs should be. I tried a few things with this, including invisible heroes, none of which are all that interesting, but I settled on an upgrade object, which are normally the kinds of things you research at a station. But since those were able to apply the buff, be added and removed as objects the same way we've been doing with our fake hero in the script, and still be mostly visible to the player when they're active by appearing on the right side of the screen with other upgrades, but not actually appearing physically on the map in a way players can see, they made the most sense. Making this decision was actually one of the biggest time sinks in this project. I set this number to an absurdly high 700 because you want to be able to notice whether the buff is actually applying, which is much easier if the numbers are ridiculous. But with that finally out of the way, all that was left is some final testing. The testing all seems to be going well, we have our buffs, we have our debuffs, and they can all be fulfilled or failed repeatedly in battle without breaking everything. There will still be more balancing, cleanup, and presumably other fixes to make, but it's finally time to check off those last non-Yavithan checkboxes and push the last changes onto our version control system so we can all move on with our lives. I hope you've enjoyed this look at exactly what goes on with the creation of a mod mechanic. Remember to like or subscribe if you did enjoy the video, and as always, special thanks to the patrons who make it possible for me to do these kinds of videos. Hope to see you next time.